this is why I, to some extent, I absolutely love COVID. I know you, you, you were very sensible in your country. And that is because in the past, we sort of structure stability, security, and certainty. We thought they existed. They're delusions. They're yeah. absolutely delusions that people build their lives on, but they're meaningless mm. if you don't know who you are. But the, lead, the leaders to to have to still have authority, they need these scares. They need to have. I've got to have it, and I mean, this, and <laughs> this is what I'm loving about Chat GPT, is all of a sudden the arrogance of knowledge doesn't exist. The only thing that matters is wisdom. <laughs> Welcome all, this is Mind the Shift and I am Anders. I guess I have a pretty mainstream, gray, uh, boring kind of middle-class background, including education. Hopefully that doesn't mean that me as a person, I as a person um, have to be boring and, and gray. Uh, lately I've actually tried to actively liberate myself from what you might call the societal matrix this whole you know, complex uh, social construct that we have, and also the ways in which this matrix forms and affects us interests me very much. My guest today is a person who has been actively freeing himself of these structures his whole life, <clears throat> more or less, I would say. Uh, welcome to the show, Anthony Willoughby. Thank you so much, Anders. Thank you. Wonderful to have you here. You held a TED talk a few years ago, uh, just to give a little background to the listeners and viewers here of, of who you are. And uh, in that TED talk, you begin you st begin that TED talk by, by uh, saying with emphasis, almost enthusiasm, I want to make it clear that there is absolutely no academic background whatsoever to what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's kind of unusual and interesting. Um, and you've, wa you've walked an unusual and very interesting life path. You you never finished any formal education, as far as I understand. On LinkedIn, you say you're, quote, unquote, vaguely educated at Harrow School. On the other hand, you've taken decades of life courses, you might say, uh, in the form of, of travels all over the planet. And you've had conversations with, as you put it, uh, everyone and, and anyone from Bill Gates to Maasai tribesmen. A life of adventure, truly. And I've seen you tagged as an eccentric, an adventurer, um, an explorer, an entrepreneur, and a team builder. So that's pretty impressive and very interesting. So, Anthony, if you, we go back to your early years. Were, were you the odd man out in school, would you say, maybe even ostracized? Oh, oh my God, yeah, I was completely ostracized. I was basically, uh, I'm eighth generation expatriate. So I've got eight generations behind me born in India and serving Her Majesty and His Majesty in India. My father even tells me at the age of five, he was saluting a mug of King George because he knew his duty in life was to serve the king and country. So, uh, you know, I was brought up, I think, sort of the last generation of a concept of duty. Um, but I was brought up in the Sudan uh, and in Egypt and sort of keeping pet, pet scorpions and taking paddle steamers down the Nile. And I remember being in game parks with uh, in East Africa, and my mother sort of shaking things out the window because we were being charged by a rhino. And she thought if she shook pepper out of the window, the rhino would go away. And oh, wow. you know, that sort of, you know, that was my sort of life. And then Within a week almost, I was at a school in England where they were saying, I haven't done your hospital bed corner yet, you know, and I just couldn't really understand what what this complete lack of enthusiasm was. And I sort of went through 10 years of it. I mean, I haven't literally not kept up with a single person I was at school because as soon as I got to the school, I said, you know, I started speaking a bit of Arabic and I was instantly known as well, you must be the wog then, you know, and, and one was literally ostracized from day one at school. And I was, you know, really, I, I think I was a privilege to be uh, ostracized. And 
You why, know, why is and, that? Why, it's an odd, odd thing to say that you're privileged to be ostracized. Because I don't think one wants to be a part of the mainstream. I mean, I think the whole thing of education, I mean, it hasn't changed in hundreds of years. It's designed to train people to work in factories or, or go to the trenches. I mean, you know, any sort of creativity has basically been dumbed out of education. I mean, you know, Ken Robinson talks about it. The brain is completely damaged by it. It removes what's creativity. You just watch kids, you lose it. And, you know, and in those days, I mean, when I was at school in England, enthusiasm was an incertifiable mental disorder. <laughs> you know, and, yeah, and I was always enthusiastic. I was so unpopular. I sort of wanted to try and do things. So I sort of went to Spain and became a bullfighter for a few days in the summer and went to a ranch of El Duque de Pino Hermoso and sort of fought bulls and stuff like that. And oh, tell us about that. How did that go, the bullfighting? Uh, not very well. I was sort of knocked over a, a few times and decided that they had some, not they were small bulls, but they had nasty horns. So I thought this is probably a bit beyond it. But, no. uh, Now, I think the my luckiest moment at school was when my housemaster decided, let's talk about your future. And he said, Anthony, let's get one thing absolutely clear. You are far, far, far too stupid to go to university. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember that moment of freedom. Mm. You know, I've no longer got to endure these ridiculous rituals yeah. that I saw no purpose in. So I, I got an exchange. Uh, to a school in America, and that's when I started hitchhiking. Uh, and I've hitched about 40,000 miles, probably about 15,000 miles in the States. I hitched by private aircraft. I hitched all over the place. And it just showed me that one has that sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. And it just opened my eyes. And it was a sort of frightening to begin with. But then I realized that with a smile, one's thumb out and a positive attitude, there is no way you can't go. So sorry, that's rather a long answer to your... Uh, no, 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 it's it's wonderful. I mean, it, speaking, we, we will definitely come back to that, yeah. pro the problems with education and all that. I want to talk, talk about that, but uh, uh, continuing with your travels, your journeys that you've made... Yeah during your whole life here you you mentioned this um, hitchhiking in the united states and i understand you went you later went to japan and since the 1970s you have crisscrossed uh, parts of the world that many would yeah would consider remote and inhospitable i and you stayed with nomadic tribes in papua new guinea yeah. east africa mongolia yeah, yeah, yeah. for example and you yeah i mean i can give you ways examples. Them. i mean I, i got back from america to england in 1971 Uh, and I just thought I've got to get out of here. Um, so I got a small, small stall on a, on the Bayswater Road in London, Hyde Park, selling bamboo hair slides. And I saved up a thousand pounds. And uh, I just bought a one way ticket on the Trans Siberian Express. Okay. And, uh, you know, I remember being in Paris, you know, Le train pour Moscou va partir en trois minutes. And, you know, the idea that in three minutes one's life is going to change. And I think one's got to sort of have that sense of adventure is still with me, an opportunity that, you know, actually heading off on that train 17 days later, you know, arriving by boat in Yokohama, yeah, uh, knowing nobody with a friend who left shortly afterwards. But it was just that sense of, of absolutely loving the uncertainty of what, what is going to be. I, I thought everybody spoke English. I had a copy of the London Yellow Pages because I thought I could put Yellow Pages from London to Yellow Pages in Tokyo. My fortune would be guaranteed. Um, so I, I just sort of love that sense of complete naivety. Yeah. Did you learn? Did you learn Jap Japanese? You were forced to learn Japanese. Not as well as I should do. I mean, I lived there for thirty years. I speak it well enough, but thirty uh, years. Yeah, I lived in oh. Japan. I based myself in Japan for thirty years. Okay. And that's from there when I started going off on different journeys yeah. uh, to the Yemen, to and then to East Africa. When I started talking, meeting the Maasai, and that's when I saw for the first time in my life. I saw people who had substance without arrogance. And I realized my entire education had been, how could I be massively arrogant with no substance? Mm. And I became fascinated to try to understand 
Why aren't we taught presence? Why aren't we taught identity? Why aren't we taught who we are? And that's when I became fascinated to see how indigenous communities teach respect, responsibility, and courage from the age of three. And they value wisdom. And those core values go through their life, but their authority, accountability, uh, uh, responsibility, accountability, and authority, they change through their lives. But the core values stay the same, which are what are taught. Mm. And, and, and you, learn, you learn these things mainly in nomadic tribes, as far as I understand? or Well, I'm also in Papua New Guinea. So basically, I mean, that's where the hunter-gatherers were. So I'd been in Kenya. And I'd met the Maasai and they were talking about, you know, respect, responsibility and courage and things like that. And I became fascinated when I got back to Tokyo. I thought, well, what have we lost? I mean, what else have we lost? So I decided I'd go to Papua New Guinea. And back in 1980, it was still pretty wild in Papua New Guinea. So they said, uh, well, uh, you know, I met the ambassador. And he said, well, why don't you go to my village? So I said, yeah, fine, I'll go to my, his village. And it was a long, long way from anywhere, shall we say, and they're all living in, in huts, etc. and they still had lots of feathers and uh, spears and uh, and all of them, big axes and stuff like that, and uh, I sort of asked, I said, so why do you have so many feathers? And they just said, well, you know, um, a big man has many feathers, but a bigger man can hand out his feathers. Oh, that's nice. That's beautiful. You know, and I just just very very brief I, I, was, I was going to show a photograph of me in Papua New Guinea but what I saw is that you know and I thought of all those people in Tokyo who thought knowledge was power they thought you know their authority was if they ordered people around that was power mm. but I learned that in Papua New Guinea you never talk about power you either got it or you haven't in which case everybody knows but the main thing is how do you contribute so you also, you've got the spear. I said, so what's the spear? They said, well, you have to earn the spear. You can't buy it. You can't sell it. You can't give it away. You have to accept the responsibility that comes with the spear. And again, I thought of all of those businessmen in Tokyo, especially the foreigners there, who had director on their name card. But they'd never actually earned anybody's respect. And I remember asking the ambassador, I said, so what is influence? He said it's by providing equal amounts of your time, your labor, and your wealth. And that can be your wealth of experience. So if you want influence, you've got to put all those three things together. So when I got back to Tokyo, as I said, I sat down with him. I said, so, Joe, what is the single most important thing in your life? Thinking he'd say his car, his family. He looked at me, he said, it is my territory. So I said, well, that's fascinating. So he then drew out on a napkin. Uh, I remember exactly where we were. And he spent the next two hours talking about the climate, the weather, the, the everything about his village, what was protecting the different relationships. And I suddenly realized that if he, that was the most important thing to him and that, that's what his knowledge and wisdom came from, it made me think then for the first 99.9% .9 of human existence, we have known our territory, and therefore we have known our aims and our ambitions. And what I sort of became fascinated was the idea that civilization is basically split power, wealth, and status. And if you had those three things split, then you really don't know what your identity is, because you don't really know what your duty is or what your aims and ambitions are or what you're protecting. So it really started to make me think, well, what else have we lost uh, in, in this sort of Western world of education that we need to reconnect to? And maybe our brains are still able to do that. Yeah, we've come a, we've come a long way from <laughs> that kind of life that they are still leading in those places. You, you have, from Papa, the... What you learned in Papua New Guinea and with the Maasai and, and in Mongolia and all those places, you have 
uh, applied that knowledge in what you do now. I understand that you run two consultancies, uh, as far yeah. as I, I know. It's territory yeah. mapping and nomadic school of business. And yeah. on, on the latter website, it says ancient solutions for today's unprecedented leadership yeah. challenges. So I uh, are both based on what you learned from oh, yeah, they are based with these indigenous peoples. Yeah, I mean, basically, after I'd met the ambassador and I thought about territory, I then went off on a series of journeys and expeditions. I thought I'd better go and find my territory. So crossing the Desert of Death, the Taklamakan Desert in China, climbing a 7,000 meter mountain without porters and oxygen, hitchhiking across Tibet from Lhasa to Kashgar. In fact, I met my wife, who's English, hitchhiking in Tibet. So I went off on these different journeys. I then opened the first outdoor team building center because I thought all people needed was trust and willpower. I thought if they had trust and willpower, they'll be successful. And so I had the first outdoor team building. Then we opened up on the Great Wall of China, had a center there. We did work with Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and other companies there, which was quite fun. But what I saw is everybody said, where do I fit in? Where do I belong? Where am I recognized? What is my identity? So I realized you can build a team in a company really quite easily, but the purpose and the identity is what is missing. And a chap called Dan Vedetta, who worked for Thompson uh, Financial, he said, look, I've got a team from Reuters coming together. I have no idea uh, about each other. They don't know each other. So that it's not a team building we want. We want to understand what their purpose and what their identity is. So I had an idea. I said, can I try something? He said, yes, you can try something. So I gave him a blank sheet of paper. And I said, so what are you hunting? What are you protecting? What are you growing? How do you see your community and your village? And instantly they could draw rivers, mountains, swamps, mammoths, and everything. And then they suddenly said, Thompson said, oh, I know... You're hunting that mammoth. Oh, we know the roads to it. So instantly they were able to communicate on what they were trying to, the problems they were trying to solve. But, so but I suppose that mammoth is a, is a symbol for something. something it else. is. I mean, that was a big client. And then they had other clients that they had to sort of fish for in, 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 the, in the lake that they were fishing. That's where they had others. And then other clients, they were growing as crops. And it was just fascinating that I could suddenly instantaneously see that we might have thousands of, or hundreds of years of, of restrictive education trying to damage our brain because it only deals at the back of the brain. It doesn't deal at the front of the brain. Yeah. But it, it actually, it's still there. So what I've spent the last 25 years doing is asking people all over the world on six continents, what is their territory? And what I've discovered is everybody can draw a map of how they see their life, their business. It depends on the question you ask in the form of really five key icons. What are you hunting in your life? What are you growing and what are you protecting? And the hunting isn't, hey, I want to get a Ferrari. I need a million pounds. It might be that. But the question is really, what is your legacy? What do you really want? What's important to you mm. that you really want to feel that essence? In which case, what is the what's, what's your passion, perhaps? What is your passion? That's what you're hunting. You're hunting passion. And if you want to hunt that passion, what do you need to grow in your life? Who do you need? And then what, are, what do you have to protect? What are those values out of sense of identity? And once you can work that out, then you can ask people to think about their village or their terrain. And what are the rivers, the mountains, the swamps? What's holding them back? What are the rivers they have to cross? What are the mountains they have to move? And then you can say, so once you've got that map, then you say, so who is really sitting around your fire? And what do you want them to bring? Do they bring you wisdom? Do they bring you knowledge? Do they bring you resources? Do they bring you protection? You know, what? who comes around your fire? Mm -hmm. And with those five icons, it's possible to get to any business strategy, any personal strategy. So we're working with billionaire families in America to get everybody to understand what they're hunting, protecting, and growing. And we're doing exactly the same thing with uh, homeless centers in Wrexham, 
uh, in in Wales for the most unfortunate people on the planet to draw about what their rivers and their mountains are. Mm. And they can then talk about their identity because it gives them a narrative. It's fascinating. I mean, this thing about the territory, I, I've seen that you you refer to that, that many uh, indigenous peoples and, and um, nomadic tribes, they say, when you ask people in, in those mm. tribes, they say that the most important life uh, thing in life is uh, my territory, the territory. And I was thinking, is that is that only in a geographical sense or is it in a, in a wider sense, perhaps? And, and when you lay this out to Westerners, does it come intuitively no natural to them also to think in this way? or? It, 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 It's completely natural, but then obviously all of the different than the emotional, the physical, the spiritual, where do you feel comfortable on your map? Where are you responsible? Where do you feel emotionally safe? Where do you feel vulnerable? So what it provides is a platform for coaches and consultants mm -hmm. to then talk to their clients about what is it that they're actually trying to do. Would this so be equivalent to what is sometimes called a mind map? That's been very popular in in, in a, uh, mind, a, a in mind a, map is slightly different. A, a mind map, what basically the territory map does, and the rivers, mountains, and swamps, and I can certainly show you some. But is it provides the context for conversation? Because you know, for the first ninety nine point nine percent of human existence, all conversations have had context. The mammoths are coming through. We need better weapons. We, the crocodiles, we're going to go hunting them. So all conversations have had context. And it's only... Do you, do you, do you mean physical context or, or just, I mean, yes, experience, had, well, physical, experiential physical, context? Physical, physical or experiential context. They've always had context in, in one way or other. But what we've got today is there is absolutely no context for business conversations normally. Or we've got to increase the market size. Well, what's happening in the market what is what is the yeah, what, what what even is a market i mean it's what very is vague isn't it yeah uh, and you know well we need better leadership well what does that mean what are yeah. the rivers we have to cross i mean so the, the, the in my opinion business is just simply jargon because there is no context to it so we're having a map well we've got to cross this river into this new market right who's going to build the river then we can say let's have a mind map of how we're going to cross the river. What are the resources we need? What are the people? And that's when you can start using a mind map. And I had a really good conversation with uh, Tony Buzan a few years ago before he died, in fact, about 20 years ago, on how we could work together with the territory map providing the context and the mind map then providing the uh, the platform, you know, the, 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 the things that needed to be done. I understand. Yeah. What what else? I mean, this thing about the territory, knowing your territory is obviously a very, a very wise thing and, and a, a good thing to learn from these indigenous peoples. What else have they understood or do they still understand that we have forgotten or don't understand? And so, I mean, for instance, what is a nomadic nomadic mindset to you? Well, it is that glory. I mean, I don't know whether you spent time with with nomads. It is just this glorious sense of being able to welcome people on their territory. You know, their doors are open. You can come straight in. They will look after you. And you've just got this glorious sense of, of absolute confidence. I mean, what I really like about them is, you know, I was talking about power, wealth, and status being split by civilization. What I love about nomads is they have the power of their personality. You know, they're big personalities. They're, they're, they're sort of there. They, they know who they are. They've got the wealth of their life experience because everything in they've learned in their life has had something that helps them to, to you know, feel that a sense of identity. Mm -hmm. And then they also have the status that they know their contribution is recognized. But I just find it fascinating being around people who have all of those three. And they, ne they never question the, their their own worth, for instance, and they know. No, they don't. And there's a lovely Mongolian expression which I've heard, which is "the more you have, the less you are." <laughs> that's that's brilliant, actually. Yeah. So the more baubles you need, the more you need to define yourself. Yeah. You know, the less identity you really have. And I think, you know, this is, you know, this is why I, to some extent, I absolutely love COVID 
I know you, you, you were very sensible in your country. And that is because in the past, we sort of structure stability, security, and certainty. We thought they existed. They're delusions. They're yeah. absolutely delusions that people build their lives on, but they're meaningless mm. if you don't know who you are. But the, uh, lead, the leaders to to have to still have authority, they need these scares. They need to have. I've got to have it, and I mean, this, <laughs> and this is what I'm loving about Chat GPT, is all of a sudden the arrogance of knowledge doesn't exist. The only thing that matters is wisdom and your ability to articulate, the ability for you to create resonance and vibrations in your voice, the words you choose and how you lead people. So for me, it is absolutely fabulous that we're going right back to the basics, the origins that were what we needed when we were in the cave are actually coming back to the sort of personalities we need. I, I, I love that way of looking at artificial intelligence. Not many people would dare to, to do that, but I, I think you're right, actually. I, I, I agree. I love it. I really, really do. And we're working with a school in Dubai. We're completely looking at how do we redefine education so it develops the head, the hand, and the whole, you know, the whole body and, and the different parts of the brain. But we're actually going to take students to spend time with Emmanuel Mancura and his community, which is a Maasai community. And they're going to be taught about what is wisdom, what is identity, how do you earn your place at the fire, and take children on that program. Uh, and, you know, already years ago, Emmanuel said when they send kids off to boarding school uh, in Kenya, when they come back from school, they say, look, you know, you've got, you've now got some knowledge. But you ain't got wisdom. <laughs> so, good. you know, to me, this is why I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Because if you want to do anything, you've got to be able to debate, mm -hmm. articulate, believe, have passion. Maybe we're on the cusp of some kind of paradigm shift there. I hope so. My God, I hope so. Mm. You know, yeah, the that... arrogance and effortless insincerity of... Uh, of the English in particular, you know, is, is no longer going to hold people in good stead. Another story from your travels uh, to indigenous peoples and, and the nomadic tribes is this, this story, the African story about the goat at the age of three, a child is given a, um, a, the responsibility for a goat and they say, the community says, look after this goat and the community thrives. Um, isn't that a little bit too large a responsibility to hand over to a, such a young child? No, not really. I mean, at the age of six, they're out there fending off hyenas. Uh, it's, it's all part of the the, uh, the coaching, you know, of developing it. And I remember once um, saying to someone, well, what happens if the goat is going to die, if the child isn't looking after it properly or something like that? And, and the reply was, well, the death of one goat is worth the lesson that the child will get. Mm. Because the lesson of their, 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 their being so distraught because they haven't looked after the goat correctly or the goat has died. Well, hopefully it, they will be comforted by their parents at, if that they happens. They would be, yes. But again, you've got the whole village uh, bringing it up. But, yeah. you know, we've got to realize it's a pretty harsh life out there. And if you don't have that, so therefore the age of three, they're taught that sense of identity. Mm. Well, that, yeah, it's, and it's. I love this this uh, sense of. I mean, to take to be able to take care of some something. I mean, life another life uh, <clears throat> at that age. And I, I think you're right that we, we can actually do that pretty early. But is this in some way? How, how do we apply this on Western life? Because I mean, not many people here have any connotations around taking care of a goat, you know. But how can we make this story have it make sense for a Westerner to to learn something from it? I mean, I think it's difficult. It's just how I've educated my own children. I mean, from the age of eight, they've been sleeping in mud huts with me in Africa. But I mean, I stress, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not an adventurer. I've just been curious about life. So if I'm sort of, I want to go and find something out, I normally ring someone up and talk to them and, you know, or I'll go and spend time in Africa and just wander off 
off and talk to people. But from the age of eight, my children have just been turning up in mud huts in villages in Africa and sleeping in the villages and feeling that sense of welcome. And when they got to 16, I sent them to live with the Maasai for a week uh, with a friend so they actually can walk with warriors. Um, and I just <laughs> did they balk and protest when they when no, 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 no. Oh, the stories, you know, how they suffocated the goat and drank the blood, and uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's all it's all part of you know, it's part of being human, it's part of being you know, a young man. My daughter, when she was 14, I took her to 18,000 feet on uh Kilimanjaro, and before that, she's climbed Mount Kenya, so. You know, I just think we've got to unleash courage in children. I mean, my father, when I said, how do I educate my children? He simply said, make sure they play sports at which they can get seriously hurt. Mm. You know, which horrifies certain Westerners. But I mean, I think I probably do horrify Westerners. But, you know, but we've just got to, in my opinion, rethink uh, all of the, the way we where we've got to, and with GPT taking away the arrogance of uh, uh, of education to some extent and uh, documents, it's going to become really interesting. Hmm. Are we in the West complicating things a little bit too much? Oh, I think we love complication because that's what power is. That's why we all wear different white coats. That's why we give everybody a different title, a different responsibility, a different desk size. You know, it's all it's all to to make people feel inadequate, insecure, and inferior. But then again, that's what the whole education is: someone who can actually cut up a pig and and serve it as a meal, you know, and kill an animal is sort of considered lower class to someone who's a lawyer who's got a bit of paper who can, in theory, talk differently. I mean, I think this is the uh, maybe there's more equality in. Uh, in Sweden, but uh, I mean the the other well, thing. it's just it's a mar marginal difference, I would say. Yeah, well, in in, in you know, elsewhere, it's it's a huge difference, which is completely unfortunate. Um, and I think that is you know what well, the other thing which I I think is true is that all this idea of coaching, leadership training, and all the rest is so white and individual and and sort of arrogant, whereas actually. Africa, Asia is still community based. Mm. So they still have the ideas of community. And, you know, 80% of the world, apart from America and Europe, where most of this stuff comes out of, is, is actually communal based. So they understand these values, which is what we've sort of lost. And when we talk about the West, we really are talking. You know, it's a, a, a very small number of countries. Well, I have the impression that China, I, I know very little about China, but I have the impression that China, which is a very large country, 1.3 billion people, yeah. is also not so much community-based nowadays. It's fairly, I, yeah. or, what would you say? I would agree, but I think that's deliberate. That's one child per family, and now everybody's being, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with TikTok and everybody's being spied upon. It's yeah. it's, it's it's horrendous, Yeah. Uh, but so it comes. It basically comes down very much to Africa and a few parts of Southeast Asia. No, I think I think it's most of Southeast Asia. I mean, basically, I've been going to China since '75, and I remember when people had the little red book, and I remember that, and there was definitely a greater sense of community. But just on an aside, there's a Swiss friend of mine called uh, Sonia Mechledent who runs a school in Zurich, and she's also supporting a, a community in Africa, Emmanuel Mankura's community. Mm -hmm. And basically, she asked children at the age of 10 in Switzerland to draw what the community was. And in Africa, they asked them to draw. And in Switzerland, they were already drawing one or two people maximum as to what a community was or what leadership was. Mm -hmm. So in Africa, they built, uh, they drew the community, the village and their responsibility. So already in the West, we are isolating terrifying children that they don't actually see a community mm. so we're already sort of sending people on this isolation of uh, and exams are all isolating people so let's talk about this isolation this matrix that i i, yeah. I um, labeled it <clears throat> earlier and education system and all that i mean you have said that, that titles and education employment <clears throat> sorry Legal status and societal status, they say nothing about who we are, what the essence of us are. And 
how big a mistake would you say it is to actually identify with, with those labels that many, many people do in the West? I think everybody does. I mean, I think that is absolutely the, the, the status quo. And obviously, you know, if, you, if you've got the right label, you've got more money. So in theory, you're being more successful uh, and, and, you know, you're, you're, you're doing well. But I think that's where we have to rethink what is wealth, what is our identity and what does success actually look like to us? Mm. Um, and, and yes, I think, you know, if you've got your BMW and your huge house and, and you're a spa to that, then, then that is success. Um, and I think we've got to realize that I'm not going to change anything. I mean, you know, I've been a dismal failure at so many different things, uh, commercially in other areas. So I'm not saying for a second that I've got the answer. Yeah, but failure, I mean, if we should follow your advice here and what and your life view, there are, there are no real failures in that sense because I mean failures are only lessons, and you yeah. you have learned a lot of things about life. And I mean we are we 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 are born here as free souls in these vessels, and we live here for 80, 90 years. And then, I mean, as you say yourself, I mean you you, you can't really say that you you experience failures because what's a failure? Who 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 says it's a failure? Well, just if I can just tell a little bit of the story on those lines. When I came back to England, having done my 30 years in Japan, I'd meet people and they'd say, Anthony, it's really fascinating what you're doing. We've got to have lunch. Here's my cards. So I'd ring them up the next day. And it's happened twice in a matter of 10 days. And I say, so nice meeting you, Bill. When can we have lunch? They go, sorry, didn't you realize you are the most boring little man I've ever come across? How could I possibly be interested in your ideas for Africa? So I thought, God, they're English. They speak the same language, same background as myself. So I sat down with a mate. We thought, so what do we have to do? So we decided to set up a thing called the Cock Up Club. And that is dedicated to Churchill's definition of success, which is success in life is stumbling from one disaster to another while maintaining one's enthusiasm. So I had cards printed. I was chairman of the Cock Up Club. In which case I got, oh, when's the next gathering? <laughs> or I don't do cock ups. And 20 years later, we're still having dinners and, and people talking about it. Great. That's a but good there's another sort of philosophical thing that on one of my journeys across Papua New Guinea, uh, I'm not very good at planning or anything else, but I, I had a, the ambassador drawn a line about 200 kilometers across his country, across the spine of it. And so I saw there were villages. So I thought food won't be a problem. Uh, and probably we don't need tents. So anyway, we headed off with 24 bottles of wine, no food, into the jungles. And, and one person just complained every step of the way. And what I saw is how complainers completely and utterly undermine leadership. Yeah, they suck the energy out of everybody they else. They suck it out. And they're fundamentally cowards. That is a fundamentally a, a complainer. So when I was invited to climb the 7,000-meter mountain in China, I decided to climb Africa's three 5,000-meter peaks, Kilimanjaro, Kenya, and Stanley. And I said, right, people said, can I come, can I? I said, yeah, you come, you sign a document. I will not complain. And this is it. I will not complain. Here is my list of, uh, of I will not complain document. I will not complain if I get eaten or trodden on by animals, if extra porters are employed to carry wine. If I discover I've got prima donna sentences, I can be sent home. Yeah. And I think really the most important thing. The, the best that, affidavit you can, you can sign, actually. Yeah, one has to have an I will not complain philosophy. I mean, it really is, you know, and... You know, it's a bit like when COVID came, everybody was complaining and feeling emotional. I said, you know, the Mongolians have got a word for this. I mean, oh, what's that? Shit happens. <laughs> yeah. I kind of recognize that. You know, shake yourself off. Mm. Get on with it. Well, well, I think, Forrest you know, Gump had it too. <laughs> exactly. So I think we can't complain. We've got to be responsible. And we've got to realize that our brains are still 100,000 years old or 200,000 years old. Nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. 
Well, only... Actually, nowadays they say that we are the Homo sapiens is probably more like three hundred thousand years old, and which exactly makes me realize that we've actually had civilizations before that have perished. But that's a different topic. But I'm kind that of is a fasc- that. but that is a fascinating topic that it more is. and more and more is being written out about the flood, about the change. Of oh, the yes. And, oh yes, oh yes. Oh yeah, there yeah, are, there yeah, are yeah. several hundred flood stories in all legends and all. Yes. The- Myths around the world, and everybody talks about it. And it's yeah. pretty the same time frame, ten to twelve thousand years ago. Yep. Then exactly. some, something happened. Yeah, and that's when the poles could have flipped. I mean, could have. I mean, there are so many theories about what happened. It's was it the sun? Was it comets? Was it asteroids? Was it you know? But something happened. That's that's for sure. Something happened about that time, and there was certainly. I mean, how on earth did they build those huge stones? In exactly. Tachyoma, and how did they do the pyramids? And then you look at the resonance and the vibrations at Tesla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was so much knowledge. And this they don't tell our children this in school. So yeah. let's go back to education, the education system. You've mentioned several times already that it's flawed. But what, what is the basic, what is the main problem with the educational system in the Western world? <laughs> I don't know, but I did ask Chat GPT about that the other day. Uh I can tell you. What did she say? (laughs) I will tell you exactly what she said. Uh, What is an education? Uh, One second. Um, Well, basically, this is what aspects of humanity should education focus on? Rational thinking, creativity, language and communication, ethics and morality, socialization, self-awareness and self-reflection. Um, and, and you know, I think these are the sorts of things that we've just got to start teaching: the head, hand, and heart, the the leadership essentials, personality, presentation, and and just making people feel welcome into into a community. How do we operate as a team? How do we help others feel that they are valued? Mm. So, I mean, it's basically. Uh, been boiling boiling down to only the head then i mean in the educational system you said head heart and hand but that it's just the head left isn't it it really is it's just the head left and it's just it's just not doing any good and and i don't know how much you've been doing with chat gpt but i mean it's been i asked a few questions about ancient civilizations actually (laughs) it was kind of interesting to get these answers i don't have them here but no kind of fascinating but I think, you know, the, the thing is that this is going to be available to every child and every student and everybody else. So we can't fight against it. The question is, how do we then embrace it and, and help them rethink what they're doing? Uh, on my work, uh, I'm working with a fascinating neurologist called Christine Johnson. And she has been talking about actually most of what we are learning is at the back of the brain. Whereas at the front of it is where you've got the vision, the passion, the biggest part of it. And this is, in theory, what we should be using to to really get people thinking, to be emotional. And and, and then the whole concept of music. And then again, the the hurts and the, the resonance and the vibrations and, you know, all of this to make people feel good. There's just so much stuff that... I just think one could just make it so much more interesting and valuable and and give people the opportunity to improve their decision-making emotionally, rationally, and and physically. Are the government, the judicial system, the uh, the economical system, the the health system, and all the security structures and other structures, are, are they laden with the same problems as the educational system? I think so, yeah. It's all white coat. It's all measuring the wrong things, you know, you know, you've only got to look at our national health system, which is absolutely chaotic, and the education system. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, but that's the status quo. So it's not as if we can change it. But I'm working with some schools in Dubai and some schools in England who seem to be pretty keen on really doing something that's going to be groundbreaking. So, yeah, so in, in, in what way are you in those schools changing the system and changing yeah. the way of learning things? Well, what they're looking at is really how do we create a fully educated human? So they leave school. So they've got their self-directed learning. So they actually have a map of this is what they want to achieve at school. This is what they want to achieve in their lives. These are their values. And then they can refer back to this and then how they can help each other. 
And we've started doing that reasonably successfully at a school in Scotland. Uh, and in Dubai, they want to bring that in as well. So the students can then actually show the maps to their parents of the rivers they crossed and what are the journeys their parents have been on. Where did the parents pick up their wisdom? So we're really trying to help students from an early age think about what is wisdom, what is knowledge and what is information, and then have that as being part of the debating system to create it. Now, I stress this is very, very early days that I'm working on it, but it does seem to be growing momentum. And I think the, the GPT has just completely blown away all of the restrictions or the, the fears that, uh, oh, we can't do anything because of the system. I think now people have got to realize that the system... Yeah, it sounds, is, sounds like a wonderful idea, actually. Maybe yeah. the time, time is ripe for that uh, right now. And I think there's some interest out there, especially about, among young, young people, to see life in a different yeah. way than this material, materialistic yeah. uh, way that yeah. we've been looking at it. For yeah, re redefining what is wealth. We're talking with yeah. the American uh, billionaires about setting up a thing called the Academy of Full-Hearted Prosperity. You know, what, what, what do you feel when your heart is full? What does that mean? Is it your family, your hopes, your health, your, you know, what, what, what does full-hearted really mean to you? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, we're, mm, we told a story here in, in the West, uh, or maybe in other places as well, perhaps in China and Japan. I don't know enough about those places, but a story that uh, that we have underlying human flaws, which have to be, they need to be kept in check by rules and regulations, lest chaos ensues. You, you know this story. Yeah, of is course. Is this story a, 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 a false story or is it a correct story? It's probably a bit of both, isn't it, really? Um, I wouldn't like to say one one way or the other. I mean, I haven't tried it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, there's an interesting book by a, a Dutch historian called Rutger Bregman. I don't know if you've read it. Yeah. It's called Humankind. It was released a couple of years ago. Very yeah. interesting book, which debunks many of these stories myths and legends i would say about uh human um, uh greed and and that we are so selfish and all yeah. that because i mean there, there is a story out there. there are so many stories about what would happen if we didn't have laws and regulations and all yeah. things like that but it, it, it seems as if we are actually basically pretty kind and people people don't want to hurt the, uh, hurt others uh apart from a, a, a tiny proportion of the population which are yeah. psychopaths or sociopaths or whatever yeah yeah there are not very many actually most people I, are you know I, I would like to believe that you're absolutely right i mean all my life people have been nice to me i don't think i've ever had anybody be nasty to me in any village or anywhere in the world you know i've, I've never been robbed of, you know, I've, I've never had a problem so i mean i would like to think that that is correct um, but that is why I, which is why I'm so against civilization, because it splits power, wealth, and status, and therefore it makes everybody feel uncertain and inadequate, and therefore the more that I have, the more I am. Yes, and because of because everybody believes this story, they 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 are afraid that uh, if we didn't have leaders and rulers and uh, regulations and this matrix, everything would just fall apart. So <laughs> they're they don't really question it. But uh, I mean, if you look at smaller, like you have done in uh, in these indigenous uh, cultures yeah. and things like that, even even in 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 your own little community yeah. where I, where you live in your house, your neighbors, your family, yeah. it's yeah. it isn't like it isn't like government. It's more democratic, and it's more. I mean, you listen to each other. And there are informal leaders, perhaps, and inspirers, but there are no formal leaders. It just things work. Correct, well, they, they, correct, they do. And but I think we the other thing we've got to be fairly careful of is that we don't talk about tribes as being ideal mm. because they're not. When I look at for the tribes, I look at the core values and the clarity yeah. uh, and the sense of courage. But you know, you've got FGM in Africa, you've got the male hierarchy, the male dominance. Uh, I mean, it's no worse than the English public school system. I mean, any system, in my opinion, is fundamentally flawed. And this is my theory, that we now have got this freedom of choice to shape our own destiny. And as I say in my book, you know, the opening line is, we are the first generation with the freedom of choice to shape our own destiny. 
And therefore, my journey has been to discover what I need to understand about Mother Nature, the laws of human nature, if I want to benefit from that freedom. And I think this is what we have to do. We have to realize we are free, or thank God we are in certain places, and that we're not in certain other parts of the world. But you and me and the vast majority of people in our countries have a freedom to fulfill their potential. And therefore, the question is, how do we help them with the brain that gives them different definitions of freedom? And how do we work on, on creating that sense of freedom? Because freedom is not owning too much. I mean, it seems that what happiness is after $64,000 a year or something like that, it doesn't change. Uh, you know, and I think in uh, Finland, they're now doing, giving everybody a thousand dollars a month. Well, they did. They did. I think they ended that experiment. But they, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But I, you know, I think there is now time to start rethinking and, and re-educating. So children should be educated. They have freedom. So what do they need to do? Whereas this whole education system, the teacher knows best. The teacher doesn't know best. Mm. Do you think? I don't know how spiritually inclined you are, but I guess you, you are to some extent, uh, yeah. I mean, considering yeah. <laughs> the way you've lived your life. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that we come into this life, into these uh, physical bodies, with with the deep a deep knowledge about the the essential things, like we, that we, as you say, we are free, we are loved, nobody is above anybody else, but that we f- forget this as soon as we get entrenched in this this societal matrix with all these rules and regulations that we've been. Oh, yeah. Building up for thousands of years. Do you think so? I would entirely agree with you. I mean, 20-something years ago, I wrote, I want to set up a thing called the Institute of Primal Knowledge. And what that is, is to work out which of our instincts have we had screened away from us. (laughs) Why don't we have belonging, identity, purpose from contribution? How has that affected our lives going forward? Uh, because, you know, if you talk to the Maasai, I'd love to introduce you to Emmanuel Mankura, my Maasai friend, and you could have exactly the same yeah, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, but he would be, be talking about, you know, wisdom and, and, and the values, because what I'm looking at, at the tribes that I've been with or communities that have welcomed me in, they're still pretty intact. So basically, this is how we live for the first 99.9% of human existence. So you wouldn't want to be the neighboring tribe because you might get eaten or or killed, but wel- welcoming them. So I think this is where one can talk about what is positive, what is negative, what. And with Emmanuel, what a lot he talks about is the taboos we have to leave behind. You know, in our society, what do we have to realize is just a taboo. It doesn't do anybody any good. FGM, why? Getting girls married at 14, why? You know, they can go away, they can get educated, they can come back as nurses and doctors and lawyers. So, you know, it's trying to rethink what does what does that freedom give them? And we can't be constrained by by old old systems that no longer have relevance. I mean, when I meet someone on the London tube in a suit and a tie and, you know, all very smart, I say, excuse me, which museum have you escaped from? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, we can't rely on 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 how we dress. We've got to look at what our personality is and how we come across and how yeah. we behave. Yeah, and that obviously unnerves certain people, and it does make everybody love me. Hmm. Well, it's such a sense of freedom when you when you just uh, scrap all those uh, outer status markers and uh, yeah. Just see people as they are. It's 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 liberating. I think so. I mean, my father was, you know, the last generation of empire. What you wore, how what you did, what everything was sort of, you know, was predestined. Um, and uh, you know, maybe being part of the British Empire gave him a sense of identity, but uh, yeah. it doesn't last forever. And as you get older, it, it, it becomes delusional, and you realize what did you do? But, well, uh, and then you die anyway. Uh, so <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, so, and and you, I think both both you and I believe that you come, you go somewhere then, and and then you have to, to just, uh, yeah, face what you did and what you didn't do. Well, <laughs> so, exactly. But surely you've come up with many of the similar ideas to this, haven't you, in your own life and how you? Because clearly you're incredibly curious in everything. I am. You're doing. 
Yeah, and I've been traveling a lot as well. Not not as not as boldly as you have, but uh, I've been to East Africa and I've been to Africa f- several times. Uh, yeah. Been to Latin America and not so much East Asia, but um, yeah, I love traveling. I love meeting people, and uh, as you say, I am curious, and and I I think it's it's uh, sad that we have uh, that we are so entrenched in this uh, uh, superficial kind of structure that we have built for ourselves but i think s- things are changing actually and I'm, i i want to ask you maybe to wrap this thing up to ask you about this because you, you as you have said here and and one can read uh, on your on your websites and all that you you uh, you will never complain you showed you showed us the the affidavit yeah. there um that's one of your mottos you will never complain so you're curious and you're constantly fascinated by the richness of this world and you're optimistic yeah. and positive but th- does this also uh, go for um, your view on, on the world at large. Uh, many seem to think that we are in dire straits now. They think it's chaotic and all that. Where do you think we are headed? Do you see any positive signs or do you see that it's... Oh, oh I think, I, you know, I think apart from Putin and a few other things, I think it's totally positive. I mean, I really, really do. I mean, you know, there are billions of people and running around and basically, you know, you go to India and, you know, and in theory all poor, but you feel that sense of vitality and life and energy and, uh, you know, you just, I'm incredibly positive. Yes, you know, I mean, things change, life goes on and we adapt. And if we don't adapt, then we don't evolve then. Yeah. <laughs> we can spend our lives complaining about stuff we can do nothing about. Uh, you know, in England, we're talking about, you know, how can we help the coat, uh, you know, footprint? I mean, England is only 2%. You know, I mean, what can we really do? Is it really worth our while spending years worrying about it and, and, and all the rest? Let's just get on with it. Mm. Adapt, change, and... Uh, and try to make a difference in whatever we can influence. Yeah. Do you think that we will be able to, uh, the, I mean, humankind will be able to achieve a society without titles and formal hierarchies? No. It'll, uh, people are always going to live by that, I think. You know, okay. I think, um, it's sort of probably just my own delusions. But no, I think people will always be living by the title, by the power. Uh, it's so ingrained, it really is, and uh, it, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to think we can have some small effects, but uh, I, I'm not. I'm not that positive. I'm just enjoying my own freedom to have delusions that maybe I can be have some relevance. Anthony Willoughby, it's been wonderful talking to you. You mentioned a book that I didn't mention in the beginning here, but you have uh, written a, a book at, at, at yeah. some point, yeah, yeah, which is called... It's called In Search of Inspiration. It's completely out of print, but if anybody's interested, I'd be delighted to send them a digital copy or anything. If, if, okay, uh, so that's one thing. And th- where can people go to find, if they are curious, well, they can find, find out more about your work and, and your... your my, my email is, is Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y, at uh, nomadicschoolofbusiness.com. So that is N-O-M-A-D-I-C schoolofbusiness.com. And I would adore to speak to people because what we want to do is we want to partner with people who can use the methodology because I think what this visualizing does, it I can do the inspiration and the insights, but what I really want to work with people who can do the activation and the guidance so once you've got a map of someone's territory, you can then use your experience to help them move. Where would they move? What would they do? And that's that's sort of what I want to partner with people. That's what we're partnering with coaches, consultants, and educators to use the insights uh, to help people shift and, and think about what's important and ultimately give them courageous new narratives that they can give that'll give them some sense of identity and pride. Anthony, so thank you so much for joining the Well, show. thank you so much, Anders. I really hope at some point we're sitting down having a couple of beers. Oh, yes, definitely. And good luck with uh, your uh, spreading those good human vibes now. Well, absolutely. Same to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
If you like this video and other interviews and talks and stories on Mind the Shift, please like, share, and subscribe. And most importantly, become a patron. Click on the Patreon link in the description box if you're on the cell phone or in the banner if you're on a computer. I appreciate all the support. It allows me to make more and better content. Thank you.